London and I was playing a club and I was just playing my guitar and, and uh, I did a set and uh, this, I saw this guy walk in. He was headlining that night at this club in London and I was doing a set and the guy walks in and he stands at the bar and he's just kind of listening to me. And after I did my set, he walked over and I said, he said, um, that one song you sang there, what was it called? I think it was called Hollywood Dancer, he said. Did, did you write that? I said, yeah, I did write that. He said, that was good. And then he walked away. <laughs> 28 years later, I see him again. That's remarkable. It pays I, to be nice. <laughs> it pays to be nice. That's right. <laughs> it all comes around, doesn't it? That's right. Yeah. Because if you would have said something really rotten to me that day, there would have been a whole different thing this morning, yeah? Oh, we really appreciate you being here, both of you, and uh, a, a common review of your voice is that it's just believable, that you're, what you're singing, you've lived and you've believed, and uh, we just thank you for coming. Well, you're singing one more in this worship service. So the summertime is here, and the end of the season comes, and we look back on the year we've had as a church. And a lot of really good things have happened here when we look back and just look back at some of the events we've had and some of the programs and, and we can just come here on this first Sunday of summer and just be thankful for all of those good things that happened. And summertime for me is just a time to look for some restoration and some peace and some tranquility and maybe just a time of reflection to look back but maybe also to look forward. Like I said to the kids, we're all here today. There's a million things to do on Canada Day weekend, but what, a, what a, an amazing thing that we're here today to worship together. And what we're looking at today is we're continuing in this series of questions that we have about God. And the question that we're dealing with today about God is from a little child, a little child of the church. How was God made? The questions that kids ask... Unbelievable. It's just a natural curiosity. I remember the questions Haven used to ask when she was littler, like four or five years old. I remember one hot summer day, she walked up to a, an older woman who had shorts on, and she comes up and says, Hi, why are your legs all bumpy? <laughs> well, dear, that's called cellulite. Isn't she a darling? I remember at the Loblaws, you know that wine store at the Loblaws? We're at the Loblaws going through the, 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 the checkout counter and a woman comes out of that wine store and she's got a cart that's loaded with about 10 bottles of wine. Haven walks up, hi, why do you like wine so much? <laughs> maybe the best one of all, or maybe the worst one. And Kimberly will tell this story. When Haven was at the Y in the woman's change room and a very elderly woman was just getting out of the shower and she was walking around the change room a little bit with nothing on and Haven said, hi, are you the wicked witch from Hansel and Gretel? <laughs> no. That's just what happens to people's skin and body parts as they get older. Isn't she a darling? And then there's the questions the kids have about God. And some of us have been there and have tried to answer kids' questions about God. And we've always taken Haven to funerals because we want her to know that death is a part of life just like being born is. And we want Haven to, to not be afraid of death and, and just to understand that there's nothing to fear around death. So we bring Haven to funerals of family members and friends. But the questions that she comes up with after the funerals, I mean, that's part of the problem of bringing kids to funerals. Did Grandpa get a new body? Yeah, Grandpa got a new body. That's his, that's just, that's his old body. But, well, what does his new body look like? Well, you know, we don't really know, but we can imagine it. Well, what, well, what, what does heaven look like? Well, I don't, I don't really know what heaven looks like, but I mean, the Bible paints, the Bible says it's kind of like a banquet table. Well, what does God look like? I, well, we don't know, we, but, but God may look like, and, and, and she, why did Uncle Gord have to die? And I'm like, hey, even those are all really good questions. But let's see if we can get out of the checkout line first, and then when we get home, I can start to answer some of these questions for you. When you get older, you tend to stop asking the questions. It's not because you don't wonder anymore, it's just you just stop asking. And it's 
good to unpack some of these questions. Because if people know you go to church, this is the thing. Now you maybe have noticed this. If people know that you go to church, or if people know that you're a Christian, there may be a time when the mood is right that they'll ask you some of these questions. And maybe when they're hurting. Maybe when they've lost something precious. Like their marriage. Or their health. Or a job. And that's when they might ask you a question. What does God mean to you? What does it mean to say that God is alive in your life? What does that mean? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you believe that, that the Holy Spirit works in your life? And Paul, in the book of Romans... Paul says, and I paraphrase, but Paul says all people are hardwired to believe in God. Isn't that an amazing thing? And all through the Psalms we get the same thing as the deer pants for water so I thirst for God. I find that so fascinating. The conversation I had with a friend of my son Ian in the car. He was a young adult a few years back and we were driving home from Barrie and this, this young man had no connection with the church, didn't know anything about the Bible, didn't know anything about Jesus and that's common enough for someone who's 20 years old now, but he was talking about spirit. He was talking about quantum physics and how there's so much more to this life than we can see and experience now. And he was talking about supernatural things. And he had this thirst to know about that kind of thing. And so the question today, who, who made God? That's the question. Now there were a couple of other questions that this child wrote on that piece of paper. How is heaven made? And what does God look like? Well, in Exodus 3, when Moses asked God, who are you? Another way of saying, where did you come from or who made you? God said, I am. Meaning, I've always been. I have no beginning and I have no end. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm forever, says God. And Jesus would later say, because God is forever, so also will you be forever because you're made in the image of God. Your life with God will never die. Wow. Now, when I hear that, you know, I just get to a point where I understand and I realize that there are things about God that are too big for me to ever really fully understand. It's like the concept of eternity. How can we say we ever understand eternity? We don't understand eternity. Our human minds cannot conceive of eternity. And what we have to do as a people of faith is to embrace the mystery and to revel in the mystery, and to believe that there are things so much bigger than we are. My thoughts aren't your thoughts, says God. My ways are not your ways. No mind has ever seen, Isaiah said. No ear has ever heard. No eye has ever seen the glory of God. That's remarkable. But then some might say this. How can you believe in something you don't understand? That's just a cop-out. Maybe some of you came to church today to get a, a, just a, a really nice black and white defined answer to that question. You know, isn't that just a cop-out? And I would say to you this, there are things that we believe in and trust in, but don't fully understand. Songwriters. You talk to any songwriter about how they write a song, and they will tell you, Christian or not Christian, I don't, I'm not sure where the song comes from. It comes from somewhere outside of me, and I don't really understand it. It's a mystery. I was reading an article about uh, a girl, um, what was her name? I wrote her name, Jackie Peng, 14-year-old girl who's on Canada's national chess team. This was in the Globe and Mail yesterday. And she says, I'm going to quote, she says, On the chessboard, I seem to do things that I didn't know I could do. I tap into something I didn't know I had. It's a mystery to me. We're surrounded by mystery. And just because we don't understand that mystery doesn't mean we don't believe in it. What about the power of love, the things that some people do in the name of love for other people? They sacrifice their lives for other people in the name of love. We know that that's real, but we don't really understand it. How 
things grow out of the ground. I took grade 8 science and I learned how seeds grow and, I, and photosynthesis and all of that. And, but you know what? I don't really understand it, but I know it's real. And so, so we're surrounded in this world by mystery that we don't really understand, but we know it's true. And in Christian faith, we believe in the Holy Spirit, that the Spirit is with us and it's the living presence of God and that it helps us in real ways. But we don't understand that fully. We don't understand how that works. The teaching that God has a plan for your life and that all things work together for good. Man, I believe that more than I believe anything in this world. But I don't really understand it. I don't understand how God does that. But I've experienced that God can take suffering and bad things and difficult things and mold them into miracles and into beautiful things. I don't really understand that, but I know it's true. And so there's a promise that someday, someday we will see everything face to face. In the call to worship we read, now we see as only in a reflection, as in a mirror, then we will see face to face. And that's the promise we have today as we live in this in-between time between mystery and full revelation. Back when Paul wrote that, the mirrors that they had were just polished pieces of metal. So when they looked in what Paul calls a mirror, the reflection was foggy. But Paul said there will be a day when we will see clearly, when we will see face to face. What a wonderful promise that is. So there's mystery today, yes, and we embrace that mystery, but there will be a day when it will all be clear. Wonderful promise of the Bible. But in the meantime... And this is just what I want to touch on today, because so much of the Bible is about in the meantime. You know, how do we live today? All of Jesus' parables were about in the meantime. Okay, so you live within this mystery, and maybe you believe that someday you'll know everything, but what do you do in the meantime? And so Jesus told a parable today about seed planting. Not literal seed planting, not planting in your garden, as a lot of you have done, and a lot of you might go home today and tend to, but planting seeds in the lives of people. And we know all about that kind of seed planting. If you have kids or teenagers in the house, you know about seed planting. You model for them certain things, maybe exercise habits, maybe eating habits, and they might stare at you blankly and throw another pizza pop into the microwave, but maybe someday you don't know and that's what seed planting is. All of us seed plant in one way or another. Maybe you have a cranky neighbor who complains about the length of your grass or wonders why you keep Christmas lights strewn across the top of your porch all summer, blinking lazily through the muggy July heat. But then one morning early you notice that she has forgotten to wheel her garbage out to the curb, so you do it for her. No big deal. That's seed planting. And when you plant those kinds of seeds, as we all do, you don't know what they're going to grow into, but you know and you hope they'll grow into something good. And according to Jesus in this parable, God plants these kinds of seeds in us. And in this in-between time of living within this beautiful mystery and full knowledge of God that we know is to come, God hopes the seed that God has planted in us will grow. And I imagine that to God we're kind of like that rebellious teenager or we're a little bit like that cranky neighbor. But God hopes that the seed will grow in us. Isn't that an amazing thing? We talk a lot about the hope that we have in God. In church, we place our hope in God, and that's a really important thing, important biblical teaching, but God places his hope in us. Man, it must be tough to be God sometimes, but that seed is planted in each one of us, and God's just kind of like waiting what's going to grow in this in-between time. We live in this mystery. We know full revelation is going to come, but there's a seed in us, and God's just waiting. What's it going to grow into? And so Jesus is out with his disciples and he throws a handful of seeds on ground that he knows it's not going to work. And the, people, the farmers around are frowning and murmuring, saying, well, what's he planting seeds there for? And Jesus said, these seeds are like the person who hears the word and accepts it with joy. But because he has no root, 
It lasts just a short time. When trouble comes, or any kind of problem that is a test of resolve, he gets blown away. Ian's up at scenic caves this summer working as a tour guide. Part of his tour is to take people through this uh, entrance where there are those little cedar trees that are growing onto the side of the cliff face. Have you seen those? The trees are maybe seven or eight feet tall. Some of them are 500 years old. And there's no soil. They just cling to the side of the cliff face. And you think, how on earth can that tree survive for centuries without any soil? in the wind and the rain and the snow. And then as you look closer, you see this incredible root system that those little tiny cedars have, hundreds of years old. And you realize that without a root system, the tree would die quickly. And Jesus is saying, if you're not rooted, plant this seed. Find a root in you. But it's like a lot of things. I mean, when you think about a root system, when I think I was 10 years old, I wanted to play piano. I bought the piano book. I ripped the price tags off. I was all excited. I wanted to play Billy Joel and Elton John. And then I went to my teacher, Miss Baumgartner, and she was a nice enough piano teacher, but she started me with doing the scales, C scales, left hand, C scales, right hand, up and down, up and down, then both hands, and my back hurt, and I had dry mouth, and I just wasn't having any fun at all. And she said, look, I know you want to play Pink Floyd, but whatever you want to play, it's not going to work if you don't work at it. There's got to be a commitment to it. See, when you first start at something, it's all great and things grow quickly, but if you don't have commitment to it, there's no root. It's like that with a lot of things. Wedding season coming up. I love wedding season. Bride comes down the aisle. There's nothing like seeing a bride come down the aisle. When the bride and groom are first married, you remember this. Everything's all good. You just can't get enough of each other. But you reach a point in your marriage where you realize that marriage has to be nourished. And there has to be a root system. There has to be some commitment to that marriage or it's not going to work. And often when people get involved with church and begin to ingest all of these teachings, beautiful teachings that God is real in our lives and the Holy Spirit comforts us and there's this promise of eternal life and that there is a plan for our life and those are beautiful teachings and, and we grow quickly in those teachings. And I remember in my 20s when I rediscovered the God of Jesus Christ, I was excited about those teachings. But then I realized as I got involved in church that if I wasn't willing to work at it and to make a commitment that I wouldn't have the right root system and I'd just get blown away in maybe six months or maybe a year. We've been thinking a lot about Elliot Lake this week. And it's always such a strange thing to see catastrophe on our TVs as we sit in our living rooms. It's just strange. And we just can't really imagine what it's like for someone to lose a loved one under a pile of rubble. We just really can't imagine. And those catastrophes are always, for me, a metaphor. That there is suffering in this world that is always around us in one way or another. And what roots us in these in-between times, between mystery and between full revelation, is this commitment to helping the world. Our commitment to follow Jesus into the suffering of the world as he did. That's our root system. A big part of the salvation of God comes to the lost and to the needy through what we do for them. That's what roots us. Jesus finishes the parable by tossing out one more handful of seed. This time it falls on good earth, rich, dark soil. And you can just imagine Jesus' eyes brightening up. And Jesus said, these seeds are like the person who hears and understands the word of God. He produces a crop, healthy and strong and green and fertile. And this is the person who understands that to be rooted, there's got to be a willingness to commit to the things of Christ. Mystery, that's where we are now. We have this promise that someday we'll understand fully. And maybe if that's the only thing you take away today, just that's almost enough. You know, just, just to believe that someday you will understand the mysteries of the universe fully. What an incredible thing. But today we ask God for wisdom 
in these in-between times, like Solomon. Young King Solomon, who was 18 years old when he took the throne of Israel, and God said, I'll give you anything you want. He could have had riches, he could have had power, he could have had status, could have had a new palace. And Solomon prayed simply for wisdom so that he might better serve his people. And so today we pray for wisdom in these in-between times. Who are we as a church? What do you want us to be here, God? How can we best represent Jesus Christ in this world? And as individuals, we pray, God, give us wisdom. How do you want me to live my life so that my life is not a waste, but instead a blessing to the world? Until that day when all mystery disappears forever. Amen.